Our newest object of interest in math is a line integral. There are two kinds of line integrals. There are scalar line integrals and vector line integrals. In this video, I'm just going to talk about scalar line integrals. And before we do some examples, I just want to remind you of the main steps for evaluating one of these things. So briefly, we're given a line integral. The thing that we're integrating over is some curve C. And the thing that we're integrating is a scalar valued function. The differential here, ds, represents a small chunk of the curve C. So when we compute one of these things, we're just taking a weighted sum of the curve, where the weight for each chunk is determined by the scalar function f. Okay, great. So how do we actually evaluate one of these things? I'd say there are three main steps. The first of which is the most important one, you need to parameterize the curve. In some problems this may be given to you, but in other problems you may just be told geometrically what the curve looks like. So your first step will be to come up with some vector valued function r of t and a parameter interval t from a to b, which traces out this curve. Once you have a parameterization, the differential ds is the speed of the curve times dt. That is to say, to compute ds, we'll take the norm of r prime of t. This is what approximates an arbitrarily small chunk of the curve. Once we've done that, we can convert the line integral into a regular old single variable calculus integral. The bounds in the new integral correspond to the parameter bounds that you came up with in step one, and then you change the function, and then you have your differential ds. And writing it abstractly like this looks a little scary, but this expression here really is just a single variable integral in terms of t, so you can do it. Alright, let's see this in action with a couple examples. In this first example, we want to compute the line integral of x, y over the curve c, where c is the portion of the intersection of two surfaces in the first octant. So I gave myself two surfaces. One of them is x squared plus y squared equals 4. The other one is 2x plus c equals 5. And their intersection is going to be some curve sitting in space, and we care about the portion of that curve in the first octant. I'll begin by, surprise, drawing a picture. Here's the first octant of the three-dimensional world. And then I'll think about this first surface in blue. x squared plus y squared equals 4 in the xy plane, that's a circle. So as a surface, there's no z restriction, so it just goes up and down forever, and it would be a cylinder. Now in the first octant, I would just see this slice of the cylinder. Next, I'll think about this surface in red. I can recognize that this is a plane, and in terms of sketching it, I would probably solve for z and think about the projection in the xz plane. z has to be 5 minus 2x. So in the xz plane, the z-intercept will be 5 and the x-intercept will be 2.5. The radius of that blue cylinder is 2. So that tells me that the x-intercept is going to hit a little bit outside of the cylinder. And then there's no y restriction, so the plane just extends forever, like this. So the curve C that we care about, maybe in green, is going to look like this. So we have a great picture, but to make any progress we have to remember that the first step in this process is to parameterize the curve C. How would I do that here? What I would do is I would look at the blue equation first. That makes me feel like a circle of radius 2, and I think I bet I could parameterize a circle of radius 2. I would call x 2 cosine t, and I would call y 2 sine t. And because we're in the first octant, I only care about this circle in the first quadrant, which means t I need to restrict from 0 to pi over 2. But then this curve is sitting in three dimensions, so I need a z-coordinate. The point is, is that the second equation will tell us what z has to be. 
Because we've determined x and y already, we won't have a choice for z. In particular, look at the red equation again, z equals 5 minus 2x. We've already decided that x has to be 2 cosine of t. So we have no choice. z has to be 5 minus 4 cosine t. And there we go, there's a parameterization for this curve. R of t is 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, and then 5 minus 4 cosine t, and the parameter domain is 0 to pi over 2. Is this the only parameterization that would work? Nope, you could do other things. But as long as you parameterize it correctly, you should get the same answer in the end. Alright, next up we want to compute the ds differential. Like I mentioned, ds is going to be the speed of our parameterization times dt. So that'll be the norm of r prime. r prime in this case will be negative 2 sine t, 2 cosine t, and then 4 sine t. And then taking the norm of that vector gives us square root of 4 sine squared t plus 4 cosine squared t plus 16 sine squared t. That looks horrifying, but we can simplify things a little bit. I'll do a bunch of stuff in one step. For example, I could factor out a 4 through the square root. That'll give us a 2 outside. Then, when I do that, we have a sine squared plus cosine squared. That's 1. So I could rewrite this as the square root of 1 plus 4 sine squared t, dt. There we go. We're ready for step 3, which is to just convert the integral we started with into a single variable integral. So the bounds correspond to the parameter bounds. That'll be 0 to pi over 2. The integrand is x times y. Well, x is 2 cosine t, y is 2 sine t, so x times y is going to be 2 cosine t times 2 sine t. And then ds we computed in step 2, so I'll just pop that expression in there. And we have a regular single variable calculus integral to evaluate. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. I'll pull that out front. And then this specific integral can be handled with a substitution. For example, if we call u the inside of the square root stuff, 1 plus 4 sine squared t, du in that case by the power rule, I'll get an 8, and then by the chain rule, sine of t times cosine t. And now that works pretty nicely because here I have cosine t sine t dt. So when t is 0, sine is 0, so u is 1. When t is pi over 2, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so u is going to be 4 plus 1, which is 5. We get the square root of u du, and then it's easy. Let's look at one more example. This time I'm telling us that the curve C is a line segment from the point 101 to the point 020. And I want to compute a line integral of x plus y plus z over this curve. So everything's going to be pretty much exactly the same, the only thing that changes is the parameterization. And in these problems, that's usually the toughest part. But just as before, let me draw a quick picture. We've got three dimensional space. The point 101 is maybe here. Point 020 is here. And so C is this line segment. Now the question is how do we parameterize a line segment like this? Well, deep down in your heart, somewhere, you know that to parameterize any kind of line, what do you need? You need a point on the line, and you need a direction vector. We could get a direction vector for this line segment, for example, by connecting these two points. In other words, I could let v be 0 to 0 minus 1, 0, 1. That's exactly the vector going from the red point to the blue point. There's our direction vector, and then if I want to parameterize the segment, I could start at the point 1, 0, 1 and then travel along that direction vector I found. So I would let r of t be 1, 0, 1, plus t times the direction vector. And then I can combine all the components, I would get 1 minus t, 2t, and then 1 minus t. 
Now the most important part here is to specify the correct parameter domain. We very specifically need to trace out the segment from the red point to the blue point. And your parameter domain here depends on what your parameterization is. For me, the way I wrote this, I would start at the red point at time zero. And you can see this by just plugging in time equals zero into the formula. And then at time one, I would be at the point zero to zero. So for my specific parameterization, the parameter domain is gonna be zero to one. But if you parameterize the curve differently, you might have a different domain. Anyway, we've got our parameterization so we can proceed as before. DS in this case is gonna be the norm of R prime. Well, R prime is gonna be the direction vector. This is not surprising since we're parameterizing a line segment. So R prime here is negative one, two, negative one. The magnitude of this is going to be the square root of 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared, which is 6, I think. And then we can convert the integral. Our bounds come from the parameter domain, so we get 0 to 1. And then x plus y plus z. Look at the components of our parameterization. If I take x plus y, I would get 1 minus t plus 2t is 1 plus t, and then plus z, if I add 1 minus t, the t's cancel out, so we actually just end up with 1 plus 1, which is 2. And then multiplied by ds is just root 6 dt, so we end up with an integral which is just a constant integrand. We're integrating from 0 to 1, so I pick up a factor of 1, and the final answer is 2 root 6.